tonight. Is there a God? What created us? I'm told that there was this tiny point amidst nothingness and then, say, an explosion that gradually became our world. You've got to give an explanation for how it all got here. For many of you, God is that explanation. Others say God's a fairy tale. So tonight we debate. Wherever there's a gap in scientific knowledge, religion comes in and says, well, well that's was, what God did. There was no gap. We have an open mind we, because we haven't assumed the answer before we ask the question. Science asks questions, so what does Bill Nye the science guy say? Bill, 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 Bill. Is it science versus God? That's our show tonight. And now, John Stossel. I am really out of my element here. On this show, I like to report on what I know, what I've researched and understand. But tonight, science versus God, I'm over my head. But I want to learn, so we brought in guests who think and fight about this a lot. We begin with them at the beginning. What created life? Now, I was taught there was this big bang. The entire universe was contained in a single tiny point until there was this explosion of energy. Things expanded and then cooled and life grew. And I kind of believe that. Some very smart people are convinced that's the way it went down. But did some god cause the big bang? And how did humans happen? Is there an intelligent designer, a god? Yes, says Dinesh D'Souza, who's passionate about Christianity. No, says Michael Shermer, founder of Skeptic Magazine. So, no, how do you know? You can't be certain. Well, I can't be certain there's no God, but I can be reasonably confident as a social scientist that the anthropology of religion, the psychology of religion shows that people invent gods to explain causality in the world. You want to know why there's storms, why there's accidents, why do people die, why did the tree fall over? From hunter-gatherers all the way up to the modern world, humans construct gods to explain things. And they're all, they, these are different gods, different religions. And so we've come down to monotheism, but what are the chances that those 999 other gods are false gods, and this one is the one true god that most people happen to believe in today, or that they're all socially constructed, psychologically constructed? Dinesh, well, yeah, what are the chances? Well, um, I think when we think about God, you could almost think about a tall mountain. God's at the top of it. None of us can see him. We're standing at the base. And we're just seeing these little tributaries of, of information come down. And the different religions are efforts to, to call what's at the top. It's not surprising that they tell a slightly different story, but they're all looking in the same direction. So I would say all the 999 uh, uh, religions are right in positing a transcendent God, a deity that actually is responsible for all. How do you know? Where's the evidence? It's, it's an inference to an explanation. In other words, you've got to give an explanation for how it all got here. Right? So you can, you can take Michael's explanation, which is that material things are all there are. There's nothing else. But that actually is also a leap of faith. He's assuming that there are only material things and there's nothing else. Well, it's not a leap of faith. It's a, it's a level of confidence gained from 500 years of science consistently and reliably finding causes of effects and displacing religion as the mechanism to explain things. Michael, science, isn't it an assumption of modern science that material reality is all there is? It is an assumption because exactly. it works. Because it works. Because it works, but it's the explanation testable. of God works too. Don't you think for hundreds of years people have believed in God because it has worked in yes. that it has made sense of their life? Maybe it's because they them. were ignorant. They didn't have any other, they, uh, they had no other explanation for lightning. Uh, well, that was true of ancient man, but just as scientific knowledge progresses, there's no reason religious knowledge can't progress. One of the things about science is it takes the trump card of saying we get to get smarter over time, but religious people don't. So we're going to now judge religious people by what they believed 10,000 years before. But religion doesn't change much. Sure it does. If you look at religion, first of all, there's an evolution within religion from a polytheism to monotheism. But second, even within religion, see, one of the things is I think religious people learn from other types of knowledge. So, for example, the Bible says God made the universe and God made man, but the Bible doesn't say how. So I see no problem in saying I can learn from evolution, I can learn from the Big Bang. It's a way of sort of filling out. The Bible says seven days. Well, the Bible says seven days, but from the third or fourth century, Christians have believed that those seven days refer to eras. I just want to add something before you respond, and that Michael has been on the show debating this topic before he debated a priest. And afterward, I got lots of email from people who said, you shouldn't have had that priest on, you should have had an apologist. 
An apologist? I have no idea what that is. I thought that was someone who apologizes. It turns out an apologist is someone who does what Dinesh does, who argues why there's a God. Well, uh, it comes from the Greek word apologia, which means to give a defense. It has nothing to do with making an apology or, or kind of um, repenting uh, for something. And I want to emphasize that apologetics is done on the basis of reason alone. It doesn't appeal to scripture. It doesn't appeal to revelation. It's based on the same language of reason. And, uh, and that's, that's, that leaves room for a skeptical attitude toward the world. Let's bring in two scientists. Ian Hutchinson is a Christian who teaches nuclear physics at MIT. Lawrence Krauss is a physicist from Arizona State, and he's an atheist whose new book asserts that the universe came from nothing. Nothing? Absolutely. The key question is when you, when you have this kind of debate, does, the, do you need a God? Is a God necessary? Um, is there evidence for God? And is it rational to believe in, in, in a God? The answer is sort of, you, no, 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 no. All, all, no, no, no. You don't, you don't need God to create something from nothing. The natural laws do it all the time. And there's a, the, 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 the ancient distinction between something and nothing, like most of the ancient ideas that Dinesh has talked about, are, are now been changed or thrown out by science. Uh, there's absolutely no evidence that there's any purpose to the universe. And it's clearly not rational. For, forgive me, Nish, it's just not ra It's much more rational, as Michael suggested, to force your beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality rather than the other way around. Ian Hutchinson, I I'm impressed. You're, you're a professor of nuclear science, so I, I take it that you look at the evidence, and yet you're confident that there's a God. I am, and I'd like to respond to what Lawrence just said. His book doesn't offer us a God, um, doesn't offer us a, a, a universe free of God. It doesn't offer us a universe from nothing. What Lawrence offers us is a universe from the laws of physics. And I would hope that he, as a fellow physicist, would agree that the laws of physics aren't nothing. Well, right, actually, why do you think there is an intelligent design? What convinced you? What convinces me most about the truth of Christianity is the person, the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That seems to me to be evidence. It's not scientific evidence. So if you insist that scientific evidence is the only type of evidence that you will listen to, then you will, yes, rule out religion, but you will also rule out a whole host of other types of human knowledge, like history or, or can, philosophy. Can, can let's, so let, let, me, let me jump in for a second. So you're convinced by the resurrection, which you say is consistent with the laws, with the laws of nature. It certainly isn't. I mean, generally arriving from the it's dead has not science. been consistent with biology or physics. And then you're convinced by it. But, but what evidence do you have that it happened? Essentially, this is an argument about whether or not miracles are possible, because the resurrection is a miracle. And of course, water into wine. That's so. right. So the key question is, is, can we say, based on anything we know, that scientific law Laws are true always and everywhere, and there are no exceptions to them. Notice that even Lawrence doesn't say that. He slipped in the word probably. Because, 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 because it was the way. philosopher Hume 200 years ago who pointed out that from no amount of empirical generalizations, however large, can you draw a conclusion that is true as a matter of logic. All you can say is that every time we've measured light, it goes at speed c. But you don't know that on a star, a hundred light years away, it goes at that speed. We've never we do. measured. We do. We've measured. We it. assume it. No, we, we measure it. You the measure the spectra it the of the, the light emitted by that star is directly related to the speed of light by the laws of electromagnetism. All right, two and you can science wonky for me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you two believers I, I believe a... that people are good because of religion, and wouldn't be otherwise. <laughs> No, I think that there is a universal morality built into the human nature. But I also think that religion historically is the transmission belt for teaching morality. I mean, think of how few people have learned their morality from Kant or Hegel or Schopenhauer. People have learned their morality from Christianity and Judaism and Hinduism. I have a, I have a problem with the resurrection. Uh, so you believe that Jesus was the Son of God and God incarnate also, right? Three in one, one in three. You're a monotheist, correct? A, okay. Well, so A Trinitarian. Actually. A Trinitarian. But, 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 but Jesus is Lord, right? So, as I understand it, for us to be saved, God sacrificed himself to himself to save us from himself. <laughs> this sounds to me incomprehensible, barking mad. Barking mad. Why do you think that it's barking mad? We have well over three, two and a half billion Christians in the world, right? Would you be so arrogant as to claim that one-third of the human race is barking mad? Well, 
The logic is barking mad. The people themselves are not barking mad. Well, but Why they are. They but, believe but the so other, but the other three, most Americans. I think we but the other to, three if, billion if, people don't accept Jesus as their savior. No, but, we but, want but they to. also they believe, they believe, they also believe things you would call barking mad. I mean, this is my point. Is It's one thing to say that you know a bunch of Texans who are having beer and saw a UFO are out of their minds. But to actually claim that the entire human race is no. nuts. The logic because, of the argument. And we Texans, we're not. <laughs> saying no, no, but I think the point is that humans are clearly hardwired to want to believe. As, as Michael was saying, we created gods from the time we, we've been human. And we have to recognize as scientists that we want to believe, and we have to work against that. We have an experiment that gets an interesting result. We want to believe it's significant, but we have to check to see if it really is. And most of the time, it isn't. Similarly, yeah, Leo believed Newton, Kepler. Yeah, well, they were products. They were products of their time. And how the point is, are? we don't and we don't are. talk <laughs> about we don't <laughs> talk about Newton because of his Christianity, most of which was barking mad. But we talk about him because of the science he produced, because it actually affected our universe. His theology was irrelevant and has has gone in the dustbin of history. And I think the point about this this miracle nonsense that Dinesh was talking about is that. I, sure, I can't disprove that miracles happen. I can't disprove that we weren't here, that the whole universe wasn't created 15 seconds ago and we were created here with the memories of this delightful conversation we've had for a little bit longer than that. But it's not rational to believe in that. I can't disprove it. But it's not, it's kind of irrational Dinesh, to suggest that. You're irrational. Well, first of all, I think science itself teaches us that things that seem stupendous and at one time, right, prove to be not so stupendous in another time. So, for example, the idea of making a blind man see to you and me seems preposterous, or the idea of bringing a dead person back to life. Now, what if it was the case a hundred years from now that due to technology, we actually could make blind people see? Suddenly, the idea that blind people can see won't be so preposterous. So, we are prisoners of the limitations of current knowledge and consider everything that we don't know to be so out of bounds that it's even unthinkable. And it is. Well, actually, until that's, we... I get paid to think about the things that we don't understand. Right. And, and I, I, I take exception to that. I think scientists realize there are limits to our knowledge and in the areas where we uh, do, haven't measured things and don't understand things there, there are a lot of open possibilities in fact we have an open mind we because we haven't assumed the answer before we ask the question which is the difference between science and religion we hear from from Michael that that, that things are are crazy we think hear from Lawrence that things are irrational this just seems to me a chant I mean you I can accept that you don't believe these things and that, and you might have thought about them but to but to refer to them as irrational or craziness when you know a third of the world believes in these things it seems to me just a, a way of ending the debate I, you know, I think I think this is ultimately not about theology. What it is about is that as we are human beings, we're thrown into the world, and we can't help but ask some basic questions like, why is there a world? What's the purpose of our life? Where are we going after we die? Now, here is actually science's answer to these three questions: don't have a clue don't have a clue and don't have a clue. So this is the domain of religion, to try to give an account for very difficult questions on which science has nothing to say. Well, that's not true. I wrote true. a whole book about where we, how we came. No, how you we wrote a book here. about how the universe came, but not so, why. Lawrence um, and Michael, you're comfortable with the idea that when you die, it's just done, over, nothing. Absolutely. I, it's like what it was like before you were born. When people ask what it's like after you're dead, I say, what, what was it like before you were born? We, we don't have time to settle this tonight, as I'm sure we would with another few minutes. Thank you all for joining the argument. Coming up, Bill Nye the Science Guy. He has strong opinions about God versus no God and what your kids should be taught. That's coming up. get started on Earth? Where did evolution begin? Well, near as we can figure, the ancient Earth was covered with the ocean a little over three billion years ago, and the ocean was a sort of primordial soup that living things got started in. That's Bill Nye the Science Guy. He teaches science to kids, and this year he did a video for BigThink.com that said, grown-ups, if you wanted to deny evolution and live in a world inconsistent with everything we observe in the universe, fine. But don't make your kids do it. That caught people's attention, as you can see from these headlines. It inspired also some believers in creationism to do their own videos to argue that he was wrong. So, Bill Nye, maybe you are wrong. You can't know for sure.
But you can show that evolution is a real thing, and you can absolutely show the Earth is not six or ten thousand years old. That is, that's just wrong. So uh, I'm not going after anybody's religion, but you, we can't use tax dollars intended for science education to uh, teach this idea that the Earth is ten thousand years old as an alternative to the observable facts. I mean, that's that's inappropriate. That's what started this whole thing. And you're kind of going after religion because you say your world becomes fantastically complicated when you don't believe in evolution. Well, yeah. How did, when I dig up ancient dinosaur bones or fossil bones, it's just that you're asking too much, especially of a kid who has critical thinking skills, who's observing the world around him or her. You're asking too much. That's, that's, it's inconsistent with what we observe. Then about half of Americans are pretty inconsistent. 46% believe God created human beings sometime in the last 10,000 years, says Gallup. If that's the case, uh, I have failed. <laughs> As a science <laughs> educator, we have failed. It's just uh, these, the fact of evolution is observable and repeatable, and, and it's wonderful. It's, it's empowering. Why is it wonderful? How we learn. Because it... It gives you perspective of what I like to call our place in space, that we are, in a sense, one of the ways the universe has come to know itself. And that is wonderful. The process of science, the way we, we learn about nature, is the best idea humans have ever had. There's two questions that drive us all. Where did we come from, and are we alone? Everyone. Everyone has asked him or herself those two questions. And when you pursue that, the answers to those questions, you make these discoveries, and evolution is one of them. All right, we discover these things scientifically. The Big Bang, I believe these things happened, but the... Well, the evidence is overwhelming. People just okay. don't make it up. I mean, <laughs> Right, the evidence is overwhelming, but there's no evidence of, of that spark that created actual life. Why can't that well, be God? If you want to say it's God, I, I, it is unknowable. As we say, you can't test, you can't prove a negative, and so on. That is to say, I can't prove it's not, for example. And, but the Earth is not 10,000 years old. Ancient dinosaurs did walk this planet uh, up to 65 million years ago. Evolution was not a top, is not a top-down thing, where there's a uh, plan, a design on a drawing board, or the spiritual equivalent of a drawing board, and then organisms are created. Instead, it's bottom up that once life gets going, it creates uh, mutations, and uh, these mutations lead to us. But you, you just slipped in the line, once life gets going. I mean, why should we believe that wasn't done by God, other than, than well, that you have a bow tie I, I, and you look you, like a science I, nerd? I am a science nerd, and I encourage people to wear bow ties. They don't they don't slip into your soup. They don't flop into your flask. But that aside, you try it. You run the test. You examine the evidence. And I just want to say for me, as a critical thinker or a guy who tries to think critically, a guy who works to think scientifically, to, to argue that there's some words translated, I believe, if I understand it, from Aramaic that, are, that serve as a science text, that's just not satisfactory to me. Now, if you want to claim that God started life and then three and a half billion years uh, went by and here we are, well, I, that's very difficult to disprove. Uh, on the other hand, if you say that the earth is only 10,000 years old, that's very straightforward to disprove. That's been strongly disproven. And so that's, that's what started this whole thing. We don't want to teach that to our, our scientists and engineers of the future as an alternative to the provable, discoverable facts. Thank you, Bill Nye, science guy. Coming Thank up, you. if you're a religious person who believes that the morning after pill, birth control pill, is murder, what gives our government the right to force you to pay for what you think is murder? We debate that next. If you are religious, you most likely believe life begins at conception, that once an egg is fertilized, that's a life created by God. And if man ends that life, that's murder. 
So what does that say about Obamacare? The new health care law requires employers to pay for contraception for all their employees, including the morning after pill. So Obamacare forces employers who think abortion's murder to pay for what they think is murder. And that's an assault on liberty, says Tim Carney of the Washington Examiner. No, that's not the way to think about it, says attorney Tamara Holder. So it's not. Why? Well, first of all, employers aren't forced to give their employees birth control. The, the health insurance plan is supposed to cover certain things, and this is paid for through their premiums. So it's the, it's the insurance company that is giving health care to the employees. Obamacare requires the employer to fund the contraception of their employees, but and that, is, that how, is an infringement on liberty. Do you know how many people are actually in support of this idea or of, of this bill? That there are 70 percent. A new poll just came out that 70 percent. Okay, I'll, I'll accept that, but I would people. still say, so what? If it's 90 percent, it's not a tyranny of the majority. Do you see the problem if, if you think it's murder and you're being a force to enable it? No, you're not enabling murder. You are providing health care to your employee, and that's it. Morals should not be in the workplace. There's lots of people who want to run a business in what they consider is a moral way. Right, you but it you doesn't get the... involve sex. But, but, it uh... does not involve sex. What somebody does, now is the employer going to say, you know what, I'm not going to uh, hire you or I'm going to fire you because I heard that you have a boyfriend and you're having premarital sex with that person. Well, and I believe that that's immoral. It's just the Employers should argument. be forbidden for doing that. This guy starts a company. He has his principles, whatever they are, he doesn't get the right to say, you stand on your head if I want you to, or don't work here. But this is the law. Obamacare is a law, and the law requires health insurance. No question. And it's, and it's and a you're, bad... You're comfortable with this big law making sure women get these services, that government is right to impose this on employers. I believe that if it is a prescription medication, which birth control is, then it should be provided by the employer. They only have to woman, pay for prescription. Yes, a woman must What's get a prescription. What's the reasoning for that? Why I, is that the line? Because it's a prescription. So and yeah. it's covered. That's part of that's part of healthcare. Our prescription medication. What I'm saying is, is that if you want to take condoms, are not covered by healthcare by Obamacare. If you want to take this not out yet. of the debate, well, no, they're never going to be. <laughs> if you want to take this out of the debate, put birth control pills right next to condoms in aisle four, and you won't have the problem. What bothers me is that it's government telling everybody what to do. What if the next government is a religious conservative government, and they decree that no company can pay for contraception? And th this is part of the thing, is that when people talk about a culture war in the United States, the, it's always presented as, oh, well, you've got these religious conservatives trying to impose their morality. That's even the way the contraception mandate debate is presented. Oh, these bosses want to impose their morality. But the people imposing their morality in America today mostly, I think, are the, the cultural left. I have to fund Planned Parenthood with my tax dollars. If I'm an employer, I have to pay for my employees contraception and morning after pill. And so it's becoming illegal to live as a conservative Christian, as a conservative Jew, as a conservative Muslim. That's a culture war in America today. But here's, here's what I'm trying to wrap my head around. If you are a conservative person, are you a, are you a, a um, fiscal liberal? Because unplanned pregnancy costs $12 billion a year. This, is, this came out by the Brookings Institute, $12 billion. So are you saying, okay, well then, no birth control because I'm a, a moral moral conservative, but you know it costs taxpayers all this money, twelve billion a year. So I'm okay with that. America. Well, and this, I think this is an argument for uh, I'm I'm a Catholic, and I think it's an argument for a lot of my fellow Catholics and Christians to understand why government shouldn't be getting into these games in the first place. Because this is exactly sort of the camel's nose under the tent situation, where once government is paying for health care, then all of a sudden. It gives this this excuse for government to say, well, this is how you have to live to your stop. life. This you have to prevent happening. pregnancies. You have to you can't eat this donut. You can't smoke this cigarette. So this is an argument for anybody who says, I don't want government to infringe on my liberty to take another step back and say, maybe government shouldn't be playing a role in any of these aspects of our lives in the first place. Birth control pills cost ten dollars a month at Walmart. Why does it have to be a government? Pro Barbara Streisand not, could pay for every poor woman's birth not, control. This is not about buying at ten dollars a month. Your, your birth control pill. It's any, it's, what about, um, 
uh, you know, like I said, Viagra or OxyContin or any any kind of uh, prescription pill, health medicine or heart That's medicine. That's not mandatory. Nobody, nobody should be it forced is. to pay it's for hard. anybody else's it Viagra is. or OxyContin. It is under it is Obamacare. Under they're the, paying for Viagra. No, it's part of the prescription health plan. This is these are things the employer can't say. You know what? I believe that you shouldn't take. You shouldn't uh, if you're in pain. Why can't they? They, they're not telling you what you can and can't take. They're saying, why I'm can't going they? To Wait, yes, they Wait are. a second. Why shouldn't they? It's, my, I created this business. Why can't I say what drugs you take? You don't like it? Don't work for me. That's part of freedom. I don't want you to take your, your heart medicine, even though you have congestive heart failure. Then don't work for me. You don't, you don't have a right, I'm a nut. Don't have a don't right work to your, for me then. You don't have a right to your employer's money. But it's even a step back from that is saying, is, is this is not about whether employers are allowed to say, you can't take any birth control at all. This is another step further, simply saying, what should the employer be forced to pay for? And you are saying that you have a right to that employer's money. If he wants to pay you in cash instead of contraception, that will be illegal no, 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 come no. January 1st. No, this is, this is through the health plan. This is not, the employer is not giving a person money and saying, here's $10. But the employer go. is being is forced to a, pay for the health plan. Right. And it's the person, but the employees pay their premiums. Remember that they're paying for their, their health care as well. Them. But the employees like me who do not want to pay for premiums that cover contraception because my wife and I were Catholic. We're happy. We have four kids. We have a growing family. We, we don't want to buy that. You're making us pay for the plan that covers contraception for everybody. That's that's a, it's externalizing part of the cost. a plan. It's yeah. And that if my employer wants to provide a plan that doesn't cover your contraception, that should be up to the employer because you do not have a right to his money. But I think it's an ignorant, ignorant ar argument to say that contraception is only because you don't want to have a child. There are plenty of people who take birth control because they have, they have terrible cramps Very or true. they get cysts. We're out of time here. I say they should pay for it themselves or Barbara Streisand can afford to pay for <laughs> all the women's needs. Thank you, Tim Carney, Tamara Holder. Coming up, my struggles with God. But first, does Islam have a special problem with science? Religious American scientists have told me there's no conflict between science and religion. I would think that there must be, but I guess I'm wrong, because science has made great advances in America, a place where nine out of ten people say they believe in God. But what about the Islamic world? A thousand years ago, the Middle East made great strides in science. People there invented the windmill, algebra. They were the first to promote hygiene and medicine. But that was about a thousand years ago. Lately in the Islamic world, scientific progress has stalled. And many say it's because Muslim fundamentalism is just hostile to science. Is it? Let's ask Nadal Gassoum. He's a Muslim and a physicist. He teaches astrophysics at a university in the United Arab Emirates. And he flew here from there today because you want to clear this up. This is a big conflict. It's not necessarily a big conflict, but it is an issue that needs to be cleared indeed, because modern science has established a new paradigm, meaning that we will leave out the idea of God, leave out the idea of spirit, leave out demons and angels, etc., and work out as if there is no God, as if there is no other intervention. Science is separate. It's trial and error. It's not about... That is right. And so... Uh, religious people, and Muslims in particular, uh, find this idea distressing because in the tradition of Islam, uh, science, the understanding of the world, the contemplation of the world, is supposed to be a path toward God. It's supposed to not prove God, but at least lead you and show you that there is some glory, that there is some plan, there is some purpose to all of this. And so to do science as if God is not there, and then to go home and pray uh, is something that has not quite been worked out in the Islamic uh, mindset. But in the Christian world, some people are troubled by this. A Georgia congressman said, all that stuff I was taught about evolution, the Big Bang, this is lies straight from the pit of hell. But we have lots of scientific progress in America, mm -hmm. some often from religious scientists. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? The difference is the Muslim world went through several centuries of decline, of disintegration, of poverty, of illiteracy. 
in the West, there was this separation of church and state that sort of established itself quickly, um, which in the Muslim world is very hard to digest. How does it just go away? I mean, you invent algebra, the windmill, yeah. and then stop? Uh, not immediately. It took some time to, to decline. You know, um, empires go up and down. Uh, the Roman Empire uh, collapsed and disappeared. Uh, the Greek Empire also collapsed or at least fragmented. And the Muslim uh, did the same. It was mostly economical. It was partly uh, political. And, you know, something happened while the Muslim world was slowly disintegrating. Europe took off. And when Europe took off with the Renaissance, with uh, the uh, scientific revolution, with the industrial revolution, etc., all of a sudden, um, within half a century or one century, the Muslim world was way behind. Some Muslim fundamentalists criticize science simply because it's Western or thought of now as Western. Yes, that is true. Particularly the ideas that you mentioned earlier, uh, biological evolution, human evolution, cosmology, Big Bang, uh, stem cell research. You know, there are all these ideas that are a little bit uh, disturbing. And uh, many Muslims just look at them and say, this is from the West, so we don't have to take that. So what's it like at your university? I mean, you're teaching physics. At my university, uh, there is this uh, balance that we try to find between modern education, as we call it. We don't call it Western. We don't look at it as Western. We call it modern education. But there's also the whole idea of heritage, uh, the Arab Muslim heritage that we try to uh, distill to the students so that they grow up, you know, in a balanced personality and a balanced mind. Eighty percent of Muslims say they don't want evolution taught. 80% of Muslims reject evolution. Uh, a smaller fraction say, if you want to teach it as a theory, quote unquote, as this is the way we currently, or at least the Western scientists try to explain it, that is okay. But it is still a big problem if 80% reject it, and let's say 50% say don't teach it, and the other 50% say teach it, but we're not going to take it as a uh, real truth. We're just going to take it as some kind of a theory. Uh, this is not the dominant theme. I mean, evolution is taught in many, many parts of, of the Muslim, Arab Muslim world. It's taught in all schools in Egypt. It's not largely accepted. It's not even the teachers sometimes tell the students, we're teaching you this stuff because it's on the curriculum, but we ourselves don't believe it. So it is a problem. Uh, and, you know, once we come to the discussion and to uh, explaining to people that it doesn't have to be atheistic, that this evolution could be theistic, uh, hopefully it will work out. Thank you, Nadal Gassoum. Coming up, what would a world without God look like? My next guest says, you wouldn't want to live there. Imagine all the people living for In that song, imagine John Lennon suggests that if there were no religion, we'd live in harmony. And given all the people killed in the Crusades and in Islamic holy wars, he's got a point. But it's also true that millions of people were murdered by atheists. 60 to 100 million, depending how you define murder. Talking about Mao, Hitler, and Stalin. Larry Taunton says it's because they were atheists that they killed people. You don't know that. What do you mean? Well, uh, I'll put it the way the Russian novelist Fedor Dostoevsky put it, and that is if there is no immortality, there can be no virtue and all things are permissible. That is to say, if there, there is no God, then it's anything goes and you can do whatever you can get away with. And that clearly was, uh, was part of the driving force behind some of those communist regimes. I don't know. I am not convinced there's a God. I still try to do good things because I want to do good things. God doesn't play into it. I don't think the point here is that if you are an atheist, it, it always equals genocide. And I didn't say atheist. I'm an agnostic. Sure, I'm sure, not sure. sure. Oh, the atheists okay. are sure there's no God. <laughs> All right. But we do know this, that, that these were very definitely um, states that, that at, a, at, at a governmental level instituted atheism. And the result was... Um, Acquired uh, atheism. Yes. Eliminated religion. It, very, very definitely. But then from the top down, they were, it's, it's just a story about big government killing people. These oh, well, were dictators I mean, killing. Uh, you're, it didn't matter if the people were religious or not. They killed them. 
Uh, certainly. Um, I, I mean, listen, I think big government's uh, part of the problem here. But if you ultimately believe that there's no one to judge in the next life, your actions in this one, I think it removes some of the uh, some of the incentive for for good behavior. And and perhaps you begin to see your fellow man as nothing more than an accident in space and time. Well, what about all the Christian crusaders who killed people? Well, I. I, I wouldn't, first of all, begin to deny that many evil things have been done in the name of religion. Many evil things have been done in the name of science um, as well. But I don't think we would say that science is evil. And, uh, and I'm not prepared to say that all religion is evil. Certainly we could say that, that those killings that were done in the name of Christ were not consistent with Christ's own teaching. So uh, in that case, I would say that religion was hijacked, just as we might say that uh, the uh, eugenics movement hijacked science. Your book, The Grace Effect, argues that when people are religious, good things spread. What do you mean? Well, I mean this, that when there is a, a significant presence of Christians within a culture, and I'm not speaking of, of all religions here. Just Christianity. I'm speaking specifically of Christianity, that there is a reciprocal um, effect, that um, there's uh, more care for the poor, there's more care for the elderly, there's more care for the sick, for the orphaned. Uh, and I think the data bears this out. Give the numbers. It's a, it's a remarkable amount. Yeah, it's, it, it really is, um, John. The, uh, the average person who calls themselves um, a Christian, which we know is a very high number in this, in this country, gives three times as much of their money and their time to charities. The average evangelical gives ten times as much. When you begin to apply that to an entire culture, you begin to understand why in countries where there is a, an absence of a vibrant church, that there is also um, a lack of concern for the poor, for the, for the ones that Jesus called the least of these. You even go on to say that in the Declaration of Independence, where it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, the only way a statement like that makes sense is if man is endowed by his creator yes. with certain inalienable rights? That's right. A statement like that only makes sense within a Christian context. That is to say, what, what is well, what, what is self-evidential about the equality of man? It's just right. Yeah, well, but, but it isn't because no, no other um, uh, nation would, would have that particular view, or let us just say no, nowhere outside of the West we believe that because we have been heavily influenced by Judeo-Christian worldview because the only thing that is self-evidential about man is his inequality, um, social, physical, intellectual. There, there are massive inequalities. So what does a statement like that mean? It means that in some um, spiritual sense that men are equal. And that, of course, only makes sense if there's a God. Thank you, Larry Taunton. Coming up, my personal struggle with science and God. Thank you. I believe in science. I love what science gives us. Things like television and longer lives. My ancestors ran around naked in the cold, struggling to keep a fire going. Most died before they reached age 40. Science brings us a better life, real facts, things we can touch. Religion, not so much. I wish I believed in God, but I don't. There may be a God, but I'm not convinced. I was raised Protestant, went to the Congregational Church, studied the Bible. Then I discovered my ancestors were Jewish. I studied the Torah, tried to believe that too, but I just couldn't get there. I want to believe because I see the peace that religion brings many of you, most of you, if the polls are correct. So I don't know about the audience for this show. I envy those of you who believe. Lots of research shows religious people are happier than the rest of us. It could be just because you go to religious services and social networks there bring you friends and spending more time with friends often brings happiness. But I suspect it's more than that. Believing brings many of you joy, purpose, peace. Good for you. On the other hand, religion has led people to do awful things. The Aztecs killed thousands to appease their gods. The sun god needed daily nourishment. 
India's thuggy sect strangled people to appease Kali. The Crusaders killed hundreds of thousands of people. And then in Massachusetts, the pilgrims set up a religious police state and killed women they called witches. Islamic Jihad has killed millions. And they are done. So religion makes me nervous. Of course, I also have to say lately, Christians and most religions have pretty much stopped killing people. And you religious people, you do make the world better. Not only are you more at peace, you do more for others. Catholic schools teach the same low-income kids the government schools try to teach. But the Catholic schools do a better job at a fraction of the cost. Also, if you're religious, you're more likely to donate money and time, not just to your churches, to other organizations. You're even more likely to donate blood. Sometimes I meet people who are going to Africa or someplace to try to help the poor, and I'm struck that they're almost always Christians traveling with their church group. After disasters like the tsunami and Hurricane Sandy, it's groups like these that give the most money and volunteer time. I volunteered to help out after Sandy, too, but more volunteers came from churches. Homeowners told this group of Mormons, FEMA disappeared, but you stayed. So I was glad to hear from scientists tonight that science and religion can coexist. We need you both. That's our show. Thanks for watching.